Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching this episode of Make Me Smarter or listening to it, however you use YouTube. Uh, you know this since you're here, but we are Marketplace APM. Subscribe if you like. Also, hit the like button, too. Thanks. Uh. Hey, everybody. I'm Kai Rizdolf. <laughs> And I'm Molly well, Wood. Fairly lighthearted sigh. Nothing to sigh know. about. It was fairly lighthearted. <laughs> was Sorry, it I'm just, though? I'm just checking. I've got my phone. I on guess we'll vibrate. find out. We will. We we'll will find That's out. True. That's true. Welcome mm -hmm. to Make Me Smart, where we do, as you know, get smart about technology, the economy, and culture, with, of course, the help from all of you, because none of us is as smart as all of us. That is correct. Today. Oh man, I'm really what? excited about what? this. Oh, oh, oh I'm just excited back. about well, this yeah, episode. Good grief. I can't even. Today, today, we're going to dive into a level of nerdery that's been part of my everyday life for lo these many years. Are these social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, Google, are they simply platforms for content or are they publishers? And since everything from the 90s is cool again, we will ask that by way of a 1996 law that gave us an answer. Uh, one little part of that law called Section 230, which we brought up last week, which is sort of, was it last week or two weeks ago? Yeah, I don't know. That led to together. the idea for this entire episode, which essentially says, and I am, we're going to get way more in depth into this, but it essentially says that internet platforms should not be held legally responsible for what is posted by third parties right. on those platforms. Obviously, that question of the responsibility for content by these platforms has only gotten bigger in just the last couple of years. I mean, I think Kai and I, since this show started, have been arguing mm -hmm. about how much mm -hmm. control Twitter, at least, should have over speech on its platform. Uh, you've got YouTube now saying, okay, you know what? Turns out we're going to take down the Nazi videos instead of just... And anyway, there's been a whole bunch of backlash against YouTube, Facebook, all these other platforms over various types of content of various degrees of offense. Sorry, I'm just making a note here. Some things I want to bring up later in our discussion. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, there's so there's Facebook with the deep fake video of Nancy Pelosi. There's yeah. Twitter and China and Tiananmen and suspending accounts. And I mean, it's, it's a whole long mess. And, and as Molly said, she and I have been talking about this stuff. And we've been talking about it actually in terms uh, mostly of, uh, of Congress, right, and what Congress ought to be doing and also maybe what the companies somehow ought to be doing. Um, mm -hmm. and it's really a question about this law and it's, it's the Communications Decency Act of 1996. One of our listeners, Karen Lindsay, um, had one of the same basic questions, uh, that Molly and I have. Here you go. I think the Communications Decency Act of 1996 needs to be revisited. Thanks in large part to social media sites like Facebook, the internet is no longer a binary platform versus publisher world. Facebook may not create the content posted to its platform, but it certainly does make editorial choices about what content readers see or what content they're more likely to see. How exactly does the CDA define and differentiate publisher and platform? So here's what we're going to do. We've got Jeff Kosseff on the line. He is a professor of cybersecurity law at the U.S. Naval Academy. He is also, and this is really the reason he's here, even though I've got a soft spot in my heart for the Navy, as we know. He's the author of a book called The 26 Words That Created the Internet. And we're going to tell you what those are. But, um, Jeff, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, the 26 hey, Jeff. words, Jeff. Hit it. No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information created by another information content provider. That is Boom. the relevant section of the Communications Decency Act of 1996, Section 230, which is how we got to where we are, right? Yeah. Yes, how we got to where we are. We actually have to go far back beyond uh, earlier than 1996. And that's really the whole reason why Congress even passed Section 230. And the reason is that there was this weird rule under the First Amendment that said distributors of other people's content can't be held liable unless they know or should have known that that content was defamatory or illegal. Uh, and that worked well for bookstores that were selling books and so forth. But when, when we got to the Internet, what happened was we had these services that, frankly, my students have never even heard of called CompuServe and Prodigy uh, that took very different approaches as to how to how to provide services online. So CompuServe was like the Wild West, and it did not do any moderation. It let its users post anything they want, see anything they want. Prodigy wanted to be family friendly, so they had user policies, content policies, moderators, and they both end up getting sued in the early 90s for defamation. 
Uh, CompuServe ends up having its lawsuit dismissed because the court says you're more like a bookstore. So you didn't know, you shouldn't have known. Prodigy, on the other hand, was treated like a publisher because it moderated. So Prodigy hmm. was found that it could be on the hook for up to $200 million for a defamatory post. So Congress passed Section 230 to provide this very broad immunity for platforms because it found that there was this really perverse incentive that they were creating, that the law created for these platforms saying, if you don't moderate, you'll get more protection. And that's where Section 230 comes in. And that's when we're talking about publishers right. versus platforms. Right. You really have to understand the real distinction. You have to go back before that. Mm hmm well, because what the law aimed to do was say, there's going to be some protection for you if you get in, if you engage with this content in some way. If you do basic moderating, but you can't catch everything, right? Then you won't necessarily be liable for the stuff you didn't catch. And and you really write in this book, and and we've been talking about this for a while. Like this is the, you say the 26 words that created the internet. This is why Reddit, Google, Twitter, AOL. YouTube have not been sued out of existence many times over. This is why we have the internet economy that we have today. That's exactly right. So when you look at where the most successful platforms are based, I mean, most of them are based in the United States, and it's really not an accident. It's uh, a large part is because of Section 230. Uh, if you look at it, the United States really has the broadest protection for platforms for user-generated content in the world. Uh, if you look at Europe, for example, uh, you just cannot see the same business model working in Europe, in Europe as it does in the United States because they're just they would be liable for so much of what their users post. So, I I I I I'm wary of me being the rain on the parade guy here, um, but 1996, 23 years ago, as you say in the book. At the time that 230 was passed, only 40 million people on the planet had Internet access. Here we are now, 2019, 11 gajillion people are online, and yet we are still using a law from prehistory, really, to regulate what happens on the Internet. Discuss. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of the... So the criticism of Section 230, I actually agree with quite a bit of it. I I'm, have mixed feelings about its utility currently. I think we the, the big problem that we have right now is we've really built this entire industry, this mm -hmm. trillion dollar industry on the shoulders of Section right. 230. So I think, but I, I think absolutely. I think that, that uh, there still were harms back then. There were very real harms that were being caused by user content. Uh, the second case ever decided uh, with Section 230 in 1997 was a case where a mother sued AOL mm -hmm. because AOL's chat rooms were being used to uh, market pornographic child pornography mm -hmm. that had her son in it. I mean, that, those are tough cases even back then. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that, yes, there, there are really terrible harms that have come up in a lot of recent Section 230 cases. But I think we also want to keep in mind there's been this sort of this trade-off that's existed since the beginning, since Section 230 was passed. Hmm. Well, and it seems fair to say, you know, what's interesting is that this particular regulation did give platforms pretty broad latitude to moderate content. Like it specifically said, you have this latitude to be in there, to, to set up filters, to as a private company exercise your right to create the kind of environment that you want to create and you still won't get sued for missing some stuff. And yet they didn't. And it feels like that's a decision that is worth discussing. Why, why does Twitter have such a hands-off approach? Why has it taken YouTube so long to say, you know, we think that we're going to take stronger action against certain kinds of videos. And I get that censorship's a hard game, but what's interesting is that they did take such a hands-off approach for so long when it seems like they were better protected. I think there was a laziness for quite some time, uh, and part of it might have had to do with Section 230 that they just didn't need to be so proactive. Another part of it is that we, and it's hard to really paint with a broad brush of platforms because there really are more platforms than just Facebook and YouTube and Google. Um, but they, they are the big ones. And I think the bigger problem that 
I at least have had with them is that only in, until recently, until the past few years when they've really gotten criticism, they were so secretive about a lot of these yeah. practices. They would have these broad policies, but there was no real transparency. Uh, I, I mean, in my capacity at the Naval Academy, I work with intelligence agencies as well for other types of parts of my research. And I'll say, I often felt like I was dealing with intelligence agencies when I was dealing with the large platforms that were so secretive. And they've mm -hmm. stopped doing that, and they've started explaining some of the approaches that they've taken. And some of them have actually been very thoughtful. Um, but I think transparency is key if they want to be able to preserve the current business model that they have. Do, do you think they've got that trans the necessary transparency now? I mean, Molly and I have talked about this a lot, right? I mean, Facebook's answer yeah. to any problem that comes up with Facebook is always, more Facebook! Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's getting it's getting better. It's not it's not anywhere near where I would want to see. And again, this goes far beyond Facebook. Yeah. Um, my my concern, I, I think even if you got rid of Section 230, I I have no worries about Facebook and Google. I think they're going to they, they they will weather whatever storm comes to them. I worry about the smaller platforms that want to be the next Facebook and Google. I don't think they have the same clout, the same ability to to help craft whatever rules come out. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that they, there needs to be far more transparency about the decisions they make, but it, we also have to always keep in mind that moderation is really hard. Um, it, it is very difficult. One thing is content that someone might find to be objectionable and terrible and harmful, someone else might find to be their free speech. And then you have a private company in the middle Mm -hmm. making the decision of, well, what am I going to allow it or not allow it? They're going to get criticized by someone. Yeah, but but sorry, it's Congress, as you write, Congress decided to let the platforms have this power, and the platforms yeah. have proven themselves not up to the challenge. And the idea that we now have to count on Mark Zuckerberg or Jack Dorsey to defend free speech at the same time as they're running a for-profit company that, that controls information flow to billions of people seems problematical. Yeah, it, there, there definitely are some problems with the model. So, I mean, Section 230 was built on this theory of user empowerment, meaning that uh, users would determine the community standards that they want, and they would walk away from platforms if those platforms were not generally um, meeting those standards. Now, the big problem with that is you now have these massive companies, and it's hard to walk away from Facebook if you want to connect with your friends because, or if you want to log on to a service that uses Facebook login or all, all of those right. things. So it, th I think that that's, that's the bigger problem. And I, I'm not ready to pass judgment on yes or no, is this a good or bad moderation practice? Because frankly, and I mean, I've been researching in this area for years mm -hmm. now, I still don't have the greatest idea. I mean, I, we get bits and pieces, but I think we, we need to have a lot more light on what they're doing and also have it more collaborative and figure out what can they be doing better. And I think, frankly, a lot of the recent debates might be pushing them in this direction because it's really existential for a lot of platforms. Hmm. It is. Well, like you said, though, OK, let's say that altering, you know, fundamentally, I think we have this question, which is, do we need to change Section 230 or do these big platforms need to change the way they operate? Because like you said, if we alter 230 in a way that makes it harder for the next Facebook to be built, but Facebook, Twitter, and Google are a fine and able to absorb the blow and hire more moderators and throw some more AI on it, then have we just essentially thrown the baby out with the bathwater? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And that's why I think that the, I, I'm really glad that there are a lot of these discussions about Section 230. I've, I started pitching this book back in 2015, and uh, I'll just tell you, publishers, uh, <laughs> many publishers were like, what, what are you talking? What's yeah. a decency? What, 1996? Yeah. Why do you want to write about this? So I'm glad, I'm me. really glad that people are, <laughs> uh, are really interested in this now. But I think what we need to do is take the next step and say, okay, if we're going to make changes to Section 230 or repeal it, what will that what will the internet look like or what changes can we make that would achieve the desired effects the desired benefits without as many costs and i'm not hearing that nuanced discussion as much i'm hoping that we can start having it rather than just say section 230 is bad let's get rid of it i, I think we need we need to go a bit deeper than that do you think mm -hmm. congress you know yes congress doesn't write all the laws but eventually they have to vote does congress have the capacity do they understand enough to be able to 
fine-tune Section 230, right? Because it's not sacrosanct, right? The First Amendment is not an unlimited right, and 230 is not an unlimited clause. Um, do they have the ability to fine-tune it in, in a way that will do the most good with the least harm? I think so. I mean, I, I think they, they passed it. They, um, I, I'm not entirely sure, based on my research at least, I, I think that there were only a handful of people in Congress who were even paying attention to it yeah. at the time when it passed. But um, I, I think they do. I mean, I know Congress gets a really bad rap uh, for its technological expertise, especially in light of some of the higher profile hearings where there have been some comments that some senators and members of Congress have made. But uh, I, I do think that, I mean, this really does come down to some basic equities here about do what are our values for free speech versus privacy versus even security. And I, I think that uh, there are really some tough policy choices. And one thing I remind the platforms is that Section 230, by and large, is not required by the First Amendment. Hmm. So Congress, with one, with one vote, could get rid of Section 230. This is not a constitutional mandate. And I so so I think that the platforms and that when I say they need to be transparent, they need to really demonstrate what is the value of this really extraordinary immunity that Congress has provided. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're worried about it? I think Going they ahead. are. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so they so they know. But to the, right. to, are they counting on the lack of understanding? <laughs> I think so. I mean, I, I, I think. There just might be some belief in the power of entropy and the power of gridlock. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I think, I mean, I've either been a journalist or a lawyer or professor in D.C. for 15 years now, and I see a lot of ideas come here and then they don't materialize <laughs> because they just kind of get stuck or they end up getting added in the worst case scenario for the platforms. They get added to an appropriations bill right before winter break um, and nobody notices till it's signed. So, I mean, that's something that could happen as well. But I do think that there is this idea, uh, just like other tech legislation, there has been this big push for privacy legislation, which I think would be wonderful. But that's kind of stalled as well. Because there are so many priorities, there's so little time, there's an election next year. So I, I think that might be one thing they're counting on. Do, do you think the debate has changed in the past, uh, you know, two, three-ish now years, I guess, since the 2016 election? I mean, there, there have always been social costs to free speech that we've been willing to abide, right? Whether it's individual attacks or, you know, um, people saying horrible, 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 horrible things. We have decided that the, the value of free speech is such that individual uh, uh, injury, as it were, will be tolerated in the name of a social good. Do you think it's changed now that the injury that's being done is to democracy in a lot of ways? Yeah. So I, what's really interesting is Section 230 has really now two main vectors of criticism that really conflict with one another. Uh, from largely, I would say, uh, the conservative side, the criticism has been that platforms are doing too much moderation. They're censoring people. And the, at least the, the, this criticism says that if you're not going to be this viewpoint neutral platform, uh, you don't deserve Section 230 protection. Why are we providing this protection to platforms that will censor some voices? So that's the criticism from the right, that you're not, or, or that, that you're doing too much moderation. The criticism from the left, and I think this really is because of the election, the 2016 election, yeah. is you are not doing nearly enough moderation. And, that, and you're being somehow protected by Section 230, and that's giving you a disincentive. So, so that's why when I say that moderation is hard, I think that's a really good example where you one side is saying we want to get rid of Section 230 because you're doing too much moderation. The other is saying you're not doing enough. Well, I mean, I think, frankly, what one thing that would be good is to figure out what is the adequate level of moderation that we want the platforms to be doing. And I, right. I think then going from there. Mm hmm. Well, no pressure, uh, but you said you you said you haven't heard a nuanced conversation. I think we're starting one. If you had some, a little prescription, you know, some layers that you might be maybe twenty six more words that we could add to Section two thirty, what what might that start to look like? Well, so I think that one, and this is where I I, I think I find I fall somewhere in the middle of 
the anti and pro Section 230 folks. Uh, the pro, the real sort of diehard Section 230 folks will say no changes whatsoever. I would say that one big shortcoming is, uh, so Section 230 has, an, and this is where we get really nerdy, so, uh, so bear with me here. Um, Section 230 has an exception for federal criminal law. So violations of federal criminal law have never been protected by Section 230. Uh, but Section 230 does protect platforms from state criminal law. The problem that we've had is that obviously DOJ, FBI are pretty, are, have limited resources. And states have really, in a lot of cases, like exploitation, for example, they've really um, taken the lead on a lot of these initiatives. Yet they've not been able to go after really bad acting platforms. So... I, I'd like I, I think that we could figure out some sort of limited carve out for Section 230 for state criminal enforcement. That would really go a long way in my mind of addressing what I've seen as some of the more problematic cases. States' rights. Fascinating. <laughs> okay. Well, no, I mean I, that's super interesting because we are definitely seeing the states, as you said, take a much stronger approach. Okay. That that's like that's nuanced. That's like a simple. You know, I feel like yeah. Kai is just dying to say that Congress no, I, can't I'm, find his backsides I, and whatever. I, but no, I mean, I, look, this is good. One, this is going to help. Hopes though. We can this find an answer to this. Right? Exactly the conversation yeah. that's going to help All right. get us started. <laughs> Jeff Kosoff, uh, Kosoff, Jeff Kosoff is the author of the Twenty Six Words That Created the Internet and a professor of cybersecurity law at the U.S. Naval Academy. Jeff, thanks so much for the time. Thanks for having me. There you go. We fixed it. We fixed the internet. We fixed it. We fixed the internet. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, done man. it done yep <laughs> yep um i do i do want to know what you think because it is it is super interesting i'm so glad that we did this episode because it is so it's so complicated in so many ways censorship is comp complicated moderation all of it um i would love to know what you guys think as always what have you seen online that's made you think like that should be taken down or maybe then immediately right after things like, I don't know if I really want Facebook to have the power to just decide to take stuff down. I don't know how I feel about this. Send us a voice memo. Make me smart at marketplace.org. Hit us up. We'll be back in a minute. Boom. We're back. Magic of radio. Beow, just doo, like that. Doo, doo. The hell was that? What like, was that? I just want to sing the next part. I was singing the next oh. part. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right. What do you like? I good enough. But what do you like? You uh, have paired your list managed, from three to one. I, I, did. I didn't like it, but I did. Well, also, I just figure also, okay, I have two things. All right. There you go. Go ahead. The first one is that I want to remind everybody about our newsletter. Yeah. Oh, man. And is Way to suck up to the bosses. No, I just God. literally was like, how come I didn't see it? And I was like, I yeah. love our newsletter. It is good. It's, it's so actually good. really good. It's actually really, really, really good and interesting and well done. And I'm totally proud of it, even though, full disclosure, I didn't really have a lot to do with it. It's true. It's kind of, I mean, honestly, let's yeah. be real. That's kind of the best part. Yeah. Like it might have some, <laughs> it might have some extra stuff in here, but it's not from us. Yeah. It's not us. It's, it's like this extra us. wonderful stuff. That's Eliza right. Mills is writing it right now and she's yeah. so creative and smart and yeah. there's such clever really stuff good. in there. Uh, it looks really pretty. Marketplace.org slash newsletters if you would like to subscribe. It's beautiful. Yes. Okay, fine. What I'm now. actually fixated on is, uh, is, is look, <laughs> yeah. we think... We think right now that we're having a conversation about privacy and it's problematic. We're really not. We have not even begun to have our privacy invaded. And there, there's a <laughs> great piece that was basically... Like, it was proven right at the moment that they hit publish over at the Washington Post. Jeffrey Fowler wrote a piece about facial recognition at airports and all of the reasons that airlines want your face. Like, yeah, it's heck, it's so convenient to just be able to walk up and have them scan your face. And Delta or United JetBlue has scanned 150,000 faces. What could go wrong? And he wrote this great piece about how it's really a privacy trap that's being laid and it's all about, you know, immigration policy and possibly advertising and efficiency. But as this piece was being published, yes. news came out of a big privacy breach involving the theft of databases of people's faces and license plates and all of this kind of visual scanning that's happening and just being stored 
in unsecured databases all over the place. And it's just like, and it's only, I can't believe I'm so dark place, but it's just really hot in <laughs> Oakland and I'm so cranky. <laughs> but you guys, like, you just wait. You just wait till this starts to include, like, your genetic data, which it uh. kind of already does. And, like, your actual fundamental profound identity. Like, I, biometrics should not be treated with the lack of care that they are be, being treated with now. They should not be considered a, a, a convenience ploy because you cannot change your face. Okay, so or your this eyeball. This is where I will trot out the old Congress can't find its backside with both hands because <sighs> what is the penalty for yeah. this company now, right? That has failed to exercise the sufficient amount of care with our incredibly sensitive and personal data. Yep. Ta da. There will be no consequence. Yep. Maybe there will be a fine from the Federal Trade Commission for, I don't know, a million dollars, five million dollars. I mean, it, it. Look, it is enraging. It is enraging that we're still talking about if whether there's a possibility to retroactively slightly tweak a law from 1996 to get up to modern standards, and we have done nothing to force companies to take proper care with even basic data, let alone biometric data, let alone genetic data, let alone to, you know, data that applies to parts of ourselves that we literally cannot, we cannot alter, we cannot change, we cannot fix. Like we will be screwed. And facial recognition, and, and, and we haven't even started on killer robots. Like you think that I'm joking, <laughs> but I'm not. Like the level of, that we have inertia about the, pa the 30 year old past and we are, aren't even coming close to, to saving ourselves from the future. Which gets oh. me, if I may interject here, to Please. the thing that I uh, was, I, I can't believe we're still having this conversation. And it's, and it's going to sound really petty and stupid, but it goes to exactly what Molly was talking about. The Congress of the United States has not had a pay raise since 2009. Now, say what you will about the Congress of the United States. I certainly have said many things on this podcast about the Congress. But... You got to pay people to engage in public service or you're not going to get people in public service. Congress, the average lawmaker, the baseline salary for a member of Congress right now is one hundred seventy four thousand dollars a year. Yes, that is three times the, the uh, median pay in this country. But for running the, the world's oldest democracy, I think maybe they ought to get a little more money. And so, too, did some members of Congress this past week or two. They were working on a bipartisan bill to raise congressional pay, again, for the first time in 10 years, but it got shot down over partisan sniping and political advantage. I believe the phrase we're looking for here, people, is QED. Look it up. All right, I'm done. <laughs> my, my phrase was going to be a bad word. Okay. <laughs> I, I got yelled at last time I used a bad word. Up. Hi, Kai and Molly. This is Brent in Detroit. This is uh, Rebecca from Baltimore. It was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. <laughs> I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. No, we're going to talk about what we want to talk about. So last That's week right. we, we had a whole conversation with Anu Anand from uh, the Marketplace Morning Report uh, from the BBC World Service uh, about the Indian elections and the Indian economy uh, and how Prime Minister Modi uh, won big over there, uh, maybe bigger than anybody thought. Uh, and it got some responses. Uh, Hussein, po hmm, hmm. Hussein Ponawala uh, sent us this. Hi, Molly and Kai. Modi was elected in 2014, and I'm disappointed that you did not speak about the religious intolerance and nationalism that has accelerated under his leadership. His party's election campaign targeted religious and ethnic minorities, and the government was re-elected despite record unemployment and its failure to deliver on economic promises from the previous election. Yes, and. So that's all true, mm -hmm. except we did talk a little bit about the, the BJP and being a nationalist party. But, but look, there's lots of fodder there for sure about the issues with uh, Prime Minister Modi and, and some of his policies, for sure. Without a doubt. In fact, yeah. while I was hosting Marketplace, one of the days you were gone, there was a story about the um, the the strengthening, the stronger bans on killing cows. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And how there are people, and, and so our story was about how that hurt the leather industry, which is a really big industry in India, right. but also about how many people actually considered that an anti-Muslim hmm. action, mm -hmm. that law. Yeah, it's I'm it is true. I mean, th obviously there were lots of issues to to discuss, but I think nationalism. I just saw that I think there's a whole new podcast now about nationalism. Like, of course there is of course. A, the rise in nationalism all over, but that it, that is yeah a very true point yes. without a doubt. Uh, 
After hearing our episode, listener Tim Anderson wrote to us. He said he's visited India a lot for work and pollution, he thinks, is a big hindrance to India's society and overall growth. He said, quote, I no longer have any desire to visit Delhi or Gurgaon. Gurgaon? Because the air quality. I I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Because the air quality is just so terrible. He said, with the medical conditions, that certainly must bring with it. I wonder how that will impact society and the economy moving forward. I'm sure it's going to be huge. So look, if you look at China now, right, one of the big movements over there among young people is climate change and the environment uh, because mm-hmm. air in Beijing uh, has been notoriously bad for decades. So I think it's going to have a huge impact for sure. 11 out of the 12, this is from Vox, yeah. most polluted cities on a World Health Organization list were in India. Not to mention, I mean, India now is experiencing some of the worst effects of of hmm. warming, of literal warming. It's like 108, 109 degrees in India right now. They're having to put, I mean, they, there was a there was a piece recently that said normal life has stopped in parts of India mm-hmm. because it is so hot. They have to pour water on wow. the streets to keep them from melting. Like <laughs> there's no air conditioning anywhere. Farmers are committing suicide. I mean, it is horrible. The effects of climate change in India, not to mention yeah. the pollution levels, like without a doubt, that's a, that's a, that's damaging. Ted Sullivan. In a, mil- in a lot of ways. <laughs> yes, totally true. Ted Sullivan uh, writes and produces for television. He's currently on the CW show Riverdale, uh, also Ooh. a listener. Uh, and after he heard Anu uh, on this pod, he sent us this. Make Me Smart literally makes me smarter nice. because it expands my admittedly Western and specifically American-centric perspective to include a more global point of view. And that's had a tremendous impact on me, both as a person in real life and a storyteller for television. So thanks, guys. No, thank you. That man. is awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for listening. That makes me want to do more global episodes. Yeah, for sure. We should go on a trip. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, time for the answer to the Make Me Smart question. What is something you thought you knew and you later found out you were wrong about? Listener Alex Clausen sent us this voice memo. One thing that I thought I knew that I found out I was wrong about is uh, when I was an undergraduate student getting ready to graduate college, I was so ready to move on. The grass was definitely greener as a graduate. I just could not wait to get out of school and go be a real adult. Now, 10 years later, I I guess I regret that a little bit. And if I could just go back and tell my previous self, just enjoy where you are while you're there, um, I think that'd be pretty cool to be able to do that. So first of all, that's a good rule in life. Just enjoy while you, where you are <laughs> really while is. you're there. But also, as I believe I've said before, college is not about getting straight A's, yo. It's just not. <laughs> it's not. I'll deny this if you repeat it to any of my children, but, uh, but it's just not. Youth is wasted on the young. Yes. That's the truth. Adulting is the worst. <laughs> and the best. It's also the best. Yes. But yeah, I feel you. All right. We're gonna Again, hit... that question. No, you huh? go. Huh? Please, after you. No. Okay. Okay. What's something you thought you knew and you later found out you were wrong about? Send us a voice memo, just like Alex did. Make me smart at marketplace.org. And you, too, could appear on the podcast. Hmm. Start with a sigh, end with a sigh. Make Me Smart is produced by Shara Mars. Tony Wagner is our digital producer. The senior producer of this podcast is Eve Tro. Thanks to our video producers. That's a lot of producers. Ben Hethcote and Summer Dunsmore. (laughs) <laughs> what? This week's program, it's a lot of engineers, too. This week's program was engineered <laughs> by Drew Jostad. Our theme music was composed by engineers Ben yep. Holliday and Daniel Ramirez, yep. the executive director of On Demand, is Sitaran Yeves, and the senior vice president and general manager is Deborah Clark, who it turns out is secretly oh, all this man. time has been a member of the End of the Show Club. <laughs> she totally hosts this. She sends me and Molly an email last week that says, oh, by the way, I do listen to the End of oh, the Podcast. The that literally was her email. Pretty much, yeah. There you go. I, I didn't know that you could put that sound in an email, but you know, she's a radio professional <laughs> right. as well. That's right. Uh, so no more, no more, no more remarks about Deborah Clark. I'll just say that. I don't know. I would have believed it more if she'd put hashtag EOTP Club. Oh, that's true. Mm-hmm. Just saying. <laughs> just saying, Deb. <laughs> if you want us to believe you. That's right. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.